in Google PhD and fellowship in elite program for postdocs of the Baden Urtemberg Foundations. Today, he'll be talking on generalization bounds and neural tangent kernels for graph convolution networks. Devargo, all yours. Thank you, Arindam, for the introduction and uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, so, uh, I don't work on the reinforcement learning uh, aspect of this workshop, but uh, what I can provide is some insight into uh, the theory related to deep learning. I mean, deep learning is being used uh, everywhere practically, and uh, something that is uh, less focused on, uh, and which is also an upcoming area of research, is that how do we explain or uh, how do we understand why do neural networks work so well? And uh, there are theories, uh, some theories that one can develop for this. Uh, I mean, something that uh, it's better to say at the beginning is that we have been using machine learning and statistical methods for a really long time. But And uh, so far, whatever we have been using, we have been able to understand what the method does and uh, also provide guarantees for these methods. Uh, and also people never lost trust in these methods. But nowadays when neural networks are used a lot across different fields and in different applications, it's often used as a black box. And that's why these questions of uh, trustworthy AI and uh, other kinds of uh, problems, they have uh, come up and they have become more prominent because uh, nowadays, if you ask a machine learner or a deep learner, why is the solution like this? No one can say, uh, give a good answer. It, the answer is always, well, the neural network predicts so. So this actually, uh, raises a lot of interest in uh, understanding uh, the theory for uh, neural networks. And uh, I'll give uh, two kinds of analysis that are possible. One uh, that uh, comes from a classical learning theory uh, that is gen deriving generalization error bounds. Uh, and uh, the other aspect, this is something that uh, Chandrasekhar uh, in an earlier talk mentioned is trying to understand the behavior of uh, neural networks using other models that uh, we already know a bit on the, in the theory literature. Uh, so that would, uh, I mean, giving an, a background or a brief introduction to both of these kind of analysis is sort of my main focus, but uh, I'll do it in a particular context of uh, the research that uh, we have been doing in the past few years, and which are in the context of uh, graph neural networks. So what I'll do is I'll focus on a particular kind of problem, which is known as graph transduction or node classification. And uh, I'll give a background to both of these kind of analysis, and uh, then I'll add a, some amount of details from our uh, works in these, with related to graph neural networks. So as I said, so the plan would be these two background parts will be sort of a lecture in uh, how these analysis work and uh, why are these analysis interesting. And uh, the other three parts that I have are, will just focus it a bit in the graph transduction setting or a graph neural network setting. So let's, uh, before I go into any theory, let me just, uh, quickly give a background on what graph transduction is and what graph convolutional networks are. Although many of you may already have uh, uh, heard or at least even may have used some of these things. So the graph transduction or the node classification problem uh, is the following. We are given a graph, say on N nodes. And so we already have an adjacency matrix. And in addition, each node has some uh, features associated with it. For example, it could be the Facebook network. And then uh, along with the friendship network on Facebook, uh, each person would have uh, 
some other information like gender, which uh, location do they belong to, and other kinds of details. And let's collect all of these things in sort of a feature matrix, all the features of the data. And the node classification problem is that we know some of the uh, labels for some of the people or some value for uh, some of these individuals in the network. And we want to predict the labels of the other nodes in the network. And for convenience, I'll always assume that we know the labels for the first uh, M nodes and we want to predict the labels for the other uh, N minus M nodes. And this has application in different uh, scenarios. I said about uh, Facebook where uh, uh, one would want, one may want to know the polit, uh, one may know the political affiliation of few people and then want to predict the political affiliation of others because these are important things uh, to analyze even uh, when say a particular, particular political party makes their advertisements. Uh, other more academic kind of uh, interests are in uh, looking at the citation network, which paper cites which other paper and then try to find, and suppose we know the uh, research areas of some of these papers, we want to uh, categorize the other papers into interesting um, or into these known research fields. And one of the widely used approaches nowadays, and there used to be a lot of uh, other graph based techniques uh, for solving this uh, note classification problem. But currently, since the past uh, at least five years, there has been a huge amount of interest in using neural networks. Uh, for these kind of problems. And in particular, the basic architecture that one can use is a graph convolutional network. So what happens here is that it's similar to a neural network architecture. So you start with the features that you have, forget the graph for now, you start with the features of all the nodes, you do some linear transformation, then the graph comes in and there is a, a particular graph diffusion operator, which intuitively basically shares the information of one node to its neighbors. And then we apply the nonlinearity, and then we can keep doing it for L number of times. So that would be an, a graph convolutional network of depth L. And at the end, we would do some linear transformations. We can also take the sign if we are interested in uh, binary classification or use a softmax if we are particularly interested in classification and do whatever final processing. So this is the basic structure of a graph convolutional network. And I'll be sort of uh, vague uh, in this presentation about what we do at the end, whether it's classification, whether it's regression, uh, it's not really so important. Uh, I'll just try to give it the basic ideas uh, in most of these cases. And uh, what is of interest for us is also this one unit of operation. That is, uh, we do one linear transformation, then do this graph diffusion, and then take the nonlinearity. So that's sort of one unit of, or one layer of this GCN that would be of interest. And there are ways to do this graph diffusion. Either you can just uh, take the adjacency matrix as the graph diffusion. So basically everyone shares their information to their neighbors, or there could be normalized versions of it where uh, everyone shares their information in a normalized, some kind of normalized way. And typically in practice, this kind of uh, di normalized diffusion operators uh, work, give better results. And in fact, some of the theoretical questions arise is that, why does this happen? Can we explain why degree normalization is better than using just the self-loop kind of diffusion? So when we are uh, talking um, about this, so I'll, for most part of the talk, I'll simplify uh, this setting a bit. I'll assume that there is only one such layer. Uh, 
Later, I'll go into deeper uh, networks, but for now, let's assume there is one such layer. So the function that we are learning is uh, something of this sort. We start with the feature matrix. That's our input. The graph information comes as part of the network in terms of the diffusion operator. And then we do some kind of a matrix multiplication, take nonlinearities, do some more matrix multiplication. And finally, we would have some sort of a soft max or something at the end. So this is the kind of functions that we are trying to learn. And our parameters are these matrices uh, w, w prime that we are trying to learn. And the goal of this talk is would be to understand the performance or the behavior of this class of functions. How can we give some guarantees for them? Or how can we explain some of the behaviors like why does degree normalization work better? So first, let me uh, go back a bit and look at uh, classical learning theory. Uh, what can this that say about uh, uh, the performance of uh, neural networks or more generally machine learning? So I'll give a very brief introduction to uh, uh, statistical learning theory. So consider we have some learning problem. Say it's a classification problem. So what we would have is we would have a bunch of uh, training data or label data. And then the objective would be we choose some machine learning model, say linear classifiers. And we want to find the uh, particular classifier that minimizes our uh, training error. In this case, it's the uh, proportion of misclassified uh, nodes. But if we are just interested in this problem, this is just an uh, optimization problem. So why do we even need statistics uh, to understand this? It's because our goal is not to find the best predictor that fits the data. Our goal is to predict on unseen data. That's the concept of generalization that comes in. That is, uh, how does the model generalize to unseen data? Well. To make sense of this problem, we need a certain assumption. We need to assume that there is some underlying uh, model for the data. So the typical assumption in learning theory is that there is a probabilistic model on the features and the labels. And what we have as our training data are some uh, independent and identically distributed samples from this distribution. And the new data that we, the test data that we would have, that also comes from the same distribution. I mean, there is a literature that changes the distribution, but let's not talk about it. And the general goal of uh, the learning problem is to basically find a predictor that would minimize the expected test error. Expected because uh, we would take a random sample from the distribution. And then we would try to minimize what is the probability of misclassifying it using the predictor that we have learned. Well, but in reality, we won't have access to this uh, underlying distribution. That's why what we are satisfied, uh, or that, that's why what we do in practice is instead of this uh, generalization error or expected test error, we use an uh, estimate of it, which is basically the training error. So. Instead of this probability, I would have a sample average for that. So that's the statistical learning problem. And the question now comes is, how is this generalization error, how is this related to the uh, uh, training error of the model that we have learned? So more formally, if uh, we have this, have our training has led to this particular solution H hat, that is the rule that we have learned. How does the uh, expected test error of this H hat relate to the training error? And there is a classical theory of generalization, which basically gives the bound of this form, that the expected test error is at most the training error plus some function, which is a, a function of uh, the number of training samples and the complexity of this class of models that we have used. 
or it could be a slightly different kind of bound as well where we say that well the expected test error of the model that we have learned is at most the best possible uh, model that we could have so this is the minimum error that we could have used using any model from this function class that is say if we are using uh, learning linear classifiers the test error of the output would be at most the error of the best linear classifier plus again some function that depends on the from on the class of functions that we and uh, something that uh, uh, we observe from classical learning theory and this is a general intuition that we had carried forward for years is that if we start using more and more complicated models for example instead of uh, small neural networks we start using more deeper and uh, deeper neural networks then we would start overfitting the data so training error would reduce but we should re uh, normally see the test error to first go down and then it should go up and the kind of bounds that were derived using classical learning theory gives this kind of a curve and this was also being observed say uh, 20 years ago which has changed a lot in, uh, in the past several years. This picture is also has become, has been questioned, or is questioned nowadays. So this is what the theory of generalization used to say. And there is a particular, uh, uh, very popular uh, way to uh, measure this uh, complexity of the function class. It's known as the VC dimension. I won't say a lot about VC dimension, but let me just give an example for it. So if we are interested in say linear classifiers in two dimension, what the VC dimension does, it, it tries to capture how comp complicated data can we actually uh, model using these uh, function class. So we, say that a set of points, say if we take three points, they are, they are shattered. If we can always find a classifier from this particular class that we are interested in, in our case, linear classifiers, say, using some, uh, if uh, for any labeling of these three points, we can find some predictor that gives us the correct labels. That would naturally imply how many maximum points can be actually uh, uh, label arbitrarily using a particular model. And VC dimension is basically the size of this largest set that can be shattered. In particular, if we are in looking at linear classifiers uh, in dimension D, it is known that uh, D plus one points can be shattered. So the VC dimension is D plus one. And using this one can derive a generalization error bound as follows any model that we have learned our method has learned by minimizing the training error for that uh, model the difference between this uh, generalization error the expected test error and the training error is this function that i spoke about uh, and i say that this a function which is in terms of this complexity of the uh, class of function complexity of the model and the number of training samples so the complexity is given by the VC dimension here, and we have a factor of log M over M. So if we use more and more training data, this bound actually goes to zero, and uh, the difference also goes to zero. But if we have a more complicated function class, say instead of linear classifiers, we use neural networks, the VC dimension would be higher. And uh, then, the generalization error could be much worse than the training error. And this really gives this kind of picture that I mentioned before. So how can we use this uh, classical learning theory uh, to say something about the generalization error of GCMs? Well, we uh, are in a slightly different setting here. So let me just change the setting a bit. So. In this uh, graph transaction setting, there is no new nodes that would suddenly pop up. So we know all the nodes and all the features that we can have, but out of them, we know the labels of, as I said, the first M nodes, 
Uh, it could be any M nodes, but let's say the first M nodes. And we want to predict the labels of the other uh, N minus M nodes. So here our training error is um, uh, sort of this sample average of the uh, uh, training error for any particular model uh, is the sample average of the number of uh, misclassifications this model is doing. And the generalization error in some sense is this uh, sample average over uh, all the unseen nodes or the nodes for which we have not observed the labels. And as I said before, let's uh, assume that we have this one layer GCN, so, which would simplify the bounds that I'm going to talk about. And we use a diffusion operator S. It could be either the self loop operator or it could be a normalized operator. And if we use a VC dimension, uh, so I hope there are no questions. Uh, Arindam, please let me know if there are any questions in, in the chat. No, there is no, no question. Okay, thanks. So uh, if we use a, the VC dimension kind of analysis that I mentioned before, what we can say is that uh, the generalization error uh, minus the straining error that we had is order of uh, the rank of this diffusion operator and this term log m over m. Uh, because the VC dimension, there are additional terms, which I'm sort of ignoring, but uh, the VC dimension is mainly characterized by this rank of the diffusion operator. Now, the funny thing is that in any practical graph that you take with N nodes, the rank of S is going to be about N. Uh, and uh, if, if and if you take this self loop kind of no, uh, diffusion, or if you take a norm, degree normalized diffusion, whatever you take, the rank is going to be n, unless you start taking very um, uninteresting kind of diffusion diffusion operators. Every diffusion basically would look the same under this VC kind of bound. So there is a question in the chat. Pralada yeah. Rao asked that VC dimension is it a new one? No, it's classical VC dimension. <laughs> it's, uh, let me see if I can open. Yeah, so uh, it's uh, the VC dimension actually was proposed in 60s and 70s, and it, it has been used in machine learning or the ma uh, machine learning theory literature for uh, a very long, long time. I mean, uh, it's, we particularly for this paper saw that the VC dimension of uh, uh, GCNs are, are given by the rank of S, but uh, the concept of VC dimension is very old. I hope that answers the question. So basically what we see is that since it depends on the rank, this bound, it's practically non-informative uh, because it doesn't say that uh, whether uh, normalization helps or doesn't help or uh, uh, also since it's about n, the bound basically looks something like n divided by m, uh, square root of n divided by m, where n is typically larger than m. So it, it's a, a term that is larger than one. And both of these terms that we were trying to bound, they are smaller than one. So this ends up giving, leading to uh, trivial kind of bounds. So let's try to use some more information. And uh, basically the contribution of this paper was trying to use, give a data dependent bound uh, using, uh, again, it's, uh, old concept known as Radamacher complexity. Um, it again measures the complexity of the function class, but it uses more information uh, in terms of, uh, in this case, it would be, it uses the feature matrix as well. And I won't give the exact bound. I'll give a very simplified version of the bound. Uh, and uh, also a small note, uh, we don't use a uh, classical Radamacher complexity because it's the problem of uh, 
graph transduction. So you, we use something called transductive rata marker complexity. And the bound is of the following form. It uh, uses the infinity norm and the two infinity norm of uh, these matrices, the, either the diffusion matrix or uh, the product of the diffusion matrix and the feature matrix. And there are other terms, so I'm hiding a lot of uh, details in there. Um, okay, so there is another question from Joy. Is, it, uh, is the unseen data also have to be from the IID data set? Um, yes, in VC dimension, yes. So, uh, otherwise, the theory cannot... Uh, so if we uh, give a completely new data, then our model is not uh, supposed to even uh, predict well. This happens a bit differently in the gra graph setting because uh, we already know all the nodes. We just don't know the labels of all the nodes. And, uh, but in, even in classical setting, there needs to be the same distribution that govern all the data. Now, what does this kind of a bound give us? Uh, well, it gives a much more information than the rank that we were, uh, that we earlier had. So uh, one can, uh, it's easy to check that uh, this uh, infinity, infinity norm of the normalized uh, diffusion operator is much smaller than uh, the infinity norm of this self loop uh, diffusion operator, which all, already indicates that uh, the bound would be smaller for if we use normalization and uh, hence normalized, op uh, I mean, doing using degree normalized operators would give better results. That is something that we also observe in practice. So a lot of the theory here is about, can our theory explain what people observe in practice? Because uh, unless the theory and practice match, well, there is no reason to even do theory. One could just use, take a deep learning model and uh, use it in some application and no one would understand what happens in, in that black box. So one of the main goals of uh, the theory is to even explain what we see in practice. And this kind of theory does give some information about it, that normalization would help because the generalization error bound reduces. Also what it additionally gives is the fact that uh, it helps if uh, there is some correlation between the graph information and the feature information. That's what really comes out of uh, this kind of a product. And uh, this is way more informative as I'll show soon in the next slide. So we did some uh, uh, experiments with some random graphs and uh, I'll also show some result with uh, a real data set. So we were generating graphs with which have a community structure. So the adjacency matrix looks like this. So there are more edges within the communities and few edges across. And then the uh, features were uh, generated uh, as some uh, Gaussian mixture model. And first let's take uh, some features. So this is how the feature matrix looks like. Let's first make it aligned with the community. So you can see the same block structure that you see here, like first half set of half nodes are in this one community and the next half nodes are in the second community. You can see, see the same kind of block structure here. And the second one is when it's completely not aligned. And when you're doing simulations, you can do anything in between as well. And uh, this is what uh, we see in simulations that as you make them, um, so, Going from left to right, we are basically uh, uh, increasing the um, amount of uh, correlation. And uh, what in practice we observe is that, that as we increase this, then the error typically increases, test error increases. And this is also what the transductive Radamaka bound, this red line that also shows this thing. But as I said, VC dimension doesn't even have this information. So it would just predict a constant. 
And there's a similar kind of thing that we can see even in, um, so Quora is a particular data set. And what we did was we added some noise to the features to make it, uh, um, uh, to vary the correlation between the graph structure and the features. And again, we see something uh, similar here. So uh, a radar marker kind of bounds gives a bit more information, but it still doesn't give uh, enough amount of information. Um, that's what is known now in practice is, is that these generalization error bounds, they give some amount of information, but doesn't give the complete picture. And with that, I would give another kind of analysis that one could try to uh, understand neural networks. And it's about uh, looking at neural networks that are very wide. And this is something that Chandrasekhar gave a talk on, uh, I think yesterday or day before. So I'll again consider a very simple setting. Suppose we have a network with one hidden layer and we have N nodes, uh, hidden units. So we can represent it uh, using this kind of a form. And uh, if we look at this function, so let's collect all the uh, trainable parameters here. So that's W and beta. Uh, let's collect all the trainable parameters and look together, call them as theta. So basically whenever I talk about particular function, it basically means uh, this type of functions parameterized by the parameter set theta. And uh, what training basically does is, given some training data, some xi, yi pairs, we want to minimize the error of uh, fitting uh, this data. And uh, for convenience, uh, I would switch from a zero one kind of error or misclassification error to a least squares error. This helps in analysis um, a lot. So we uh, minimize uh, this error and find the best theta, that is the best W beta pair. And the typical approach one uses for this is to do gradient descent. That we, is, uh, we start with some parameters theta zero, and in each iteration, we would do look at the gradient of uh, this loss and then uh, uh, update our parameter. And now if we uh, choose this learning rate eta to be very small, then the parameter update happens very slowly. And uh, what uh, helps to look at is uh, what is known as, not as gradient descent, but gradient flow, which is basically the dynamics of how these parameters update. So as theta, uh, eta goes to zero, this uh, operation basically would look like a dynamical system. Now, this shows how the, uh, during gradient descent, how does our parameters get up? How do our parameters get updated? But what happens when our parameters get updated? So uh, remember we had this uh, original label data, y1 to ym, let's, take everything together and call it a, by a vector y. And let's look at ut, which is uh, whenever we are at time t and we have this parameter set theta t, what is the predictions of the model? So this is basically I have taken for all the m uh, label samples. What is the prediction of the first sample? What is the prediction of the second sample and so on? Uh, so this is another vector that we have collected. And let's try to look at, as our as we do the training, how do, how do these predictions evolve? And that again follows a dynamical system, uh, which can be derived. So it's of this following form, that, that the gradient of this, um, or the time derivative of this uh, predictions over the time of learning is basically some matrix that depends on time times the difference between uh, these predictions and the or or original given labels. And this matrix is uh, 
basically a mat uh, some kind of a gram matrix of the gradient. So uh, the ijth entry would be the gradient of uh, our of our prediction uh, computed at xi dot product with the gradient uh, computed uh, of the prediction uh, for xj. And this has a particular form that we can define in terms of a kernel, right? For uh, any, um, we can define this uh, function that depends on the two input points, x and x prime. And uh, at any time instant, we can define this kernel uh, as uh, this dot product between the two gradients uh, with respect to the two points that we have. And this kernel is known as the neural tangent kernel. And note that it varies with time. And this neural tangent kernel is actually um, uh, can explain if we use not just neural networks, but any other le machine learning model. And if you try to understand what happens when uh, we use gradient descent on that, the neural tangent kernel can explain the behavior. I mean, does explain the behavior of um, of this model. But again, it depends on time and uh, this could be complicated. So why do we even care? Well, there are some reasons. So let's assume that we initialize all the parameters to be IID Gaussian. And let's take the network width. So by network width, I mean that the number of uh, hidden nodes here to go to infinity. Now under this setting, what one can show is that these uh, neural tangent kernel does not really change with time. I mean, the change is arbitrarily small. And also, uh, so whatever the kernel is at time t is same, sorry, is same as the kernel at time zero. And this turns out to be a deterministic matrix. So what it basically means is that uh, if we have an infinitely wide neural network, there is no training that happens. The model, the parameters essentially remain similar. Which is great because now we can try to explicitly compute uh, what this kernel would look like. And uh, we could theoretically uh, replace an infinitely wide neural network with basically a kernel regression uh, kind of approach with this particular neural tangent kernel. And uh, since we have used uh, IID Gaussians, we basically uh, replace it by the expectation of it. So we don't even know, need to know the initial initialization of the parameters. Given a particular architecture, I mean, I'm showing it for the simple two uh, one hidden layer case, but even for other architectures, one, can, one could potentially uh, compute this kernel matrix. And then, as I said, we can replace uh, this neural network by a kernel regression kind of approach. So the output of the neural network would basically be an output of, an, uh, of a neural kernel, tangent kernel regression, which can be simply computed using standard uh, linear uh, or standard kernel matrix uh, operations. And this neural tangent kernel is now, now known for convolutional networks, even for some uh, recurrent architectures, uh, and uh, definitely even, even for multi-layered neural networks. And uh, kernel regression is a much more older topic. Uh, so people in theory also understand it uh, a bit better than neural networks. So we could use the learning theory for kernel regression to even uh, give, say, what the generalization error bounds would be for uh, uh, this infinitely wide neural networks. So again, that was the background. And uh, you can uh, look up uh, these different kinds of uh, neural tangent kernels that have been derived. But coming back to the uh, focus of this talk, we are interested in neural tangent kernels in the graph convolutional network setting. And I won't give a lot of details here, but I'll say why we were even motivated uh, to look at this. So uh, 
The Skip Van Welling paper is uh, the paper that introduced graph convolutional networks. Um, and it's a highly popular paper and it showed some results. So something that it showed is that uh, initially we get, um, so let's look at this, um, this purple curve. So, uh, and the, this dotted blue curve. So these would be the good things to look at. So if we look at this dotted blue curve, what we see is that, uh, and we are looking at the accuracy as the number of layers increase. So when the number of layers increase, the uh, initially we get a certain test uh, error uh, at depth two, or even uh, a certain training error at depth three. And then if we use deeper and deeper layers, uh, deeper and deeper GCNs, the accuracy drops, both training and test error. And this is something that uh, cannot be really explained. And this is uh, still sort of an open problem. Why does it drop so much? And particularly in the graph uh, setting, why is it better to use shallow networks rather than go for deep networks? And the solid curves that are there, this green one and this purple one, uh, they are the results for uh, residual networks. So where there is a skip connection uh, that go across the nonlinearities as well. And if we use residual networks, this drop doesn't happen so much. So this was the motivation of uh, trying to explain why do we see this thing in uh, GCNs. And I won't go into the residual part, but uh, I'll uh, say what we can understand using NTK. So uh, I'm, uh, we used here two GCNs. One is where the, there is basically no activation. So the nonlinearity, there is no nonlinearity in the network. Um, and the other is where you, we use a standard rectified linear unit. And the dotted to, curves are, there are three different data sets that those are the three colors. And the dotted curves are what we observe for GCNs, which have been the different kinds of um, parameters with different widths and different number of epochs up to which we train it. Um, and uh, we took a lot of these uh, different uh, runs and took the best of them. Uh, best of all these possible uh, combinations that we can do. And we plotted it uh, as we increase the depth of the networks. And for the dotted curves, you can see that most of the time, uh, for linear, it's less, but for ReLU, there, you would see this drop in accuracy as the networks go deep. And then we tried to explain this kind of behavior using neural tangent kernel. And uh, then with the neural tangent kernel, there are no, no more parameters because if you see here, we can explicitly compute a particular function. And with this neural tangent kernel, one can see that it doesn't match exactly, but the trends sort of come up that, so these neural tangent kernels do explain why and ex, uh, do demonstrate that uh, even in this infinite wide setting, as we go deeper, then the uh, performance should drop. And then this is something in progress that we try to understand why these things do happen in terms of the neural tangent kernel, which is a bit simpler to analyze theoretically than a neural network with uh, a lot of combinations of parameters that we can use. And also we found that uh, the neural tangent kernel also explains that if we use residual connections, this significant drop in accuracy doesn't happen. In fact, sometimes it could also be better for a few data sets. So I won't go into the detail of how we define this kernel, but just um, so that you see that uh, this ends up being a very complex and uh, complicated and analytical. So the, we have a P-layer neural network. Uh, so the basic structure is same as what we mentioned before. I just added some other normalizing factors which uh, help in the analysis. And in fact, uh, something that we have in the um, paper is that these normalization factors are also important. 
And then considering these kind of functions, one can derive the uh, neural tangent kernel matrix, which uses the feature matrix information, the graph diffusion information, and also compute some other quantities based on uh, um, based on uh, the activation function that we use. And everything, particularly if you use a linear or ReLU kind of activation, everything can be explicitly computed here. For other activations, it would be uh, difficult to compute some of these expectations, but at least in these cases, we can get an exactly precise model of what this neural network would look like or a substitute for this neural network that is a, uh, that is a, just a fun, just a kernel matrix. So uh, again, this is an open problem. It doesn't, uh, it explains some things, but uh, it also doesn't resolve everything because uh, this entire analysis depends on the fact that we use infinitely wide networks, but in practice, we would be using finite, uh, finite networks and uh, it doesn't explain everything. Also, it doesn't, uh, I mean, for the GCN case, it's uh, still better, but uh, more generally, uh, this NDKs don't explain well what happens with deeper networks. And there are a lot of questions that are uh, there. But let me just again uh, zoom out of all these uh, specific kind of analysis and the specific case of GCNs and try to give a broad overview. Um, so, I mean, you may see uh, across the news that uh, or in different cases that a lot of people are using deep learning, but what you may not hear so often is uh, the theory that is devil trying to uh, come uh, that is coming up along with it because um, uh, as i say there are questions as to what does this black box really do and uh, practitioners really cannot explain these questions and th that is where the, the theory uh, theoreticians need to come in and uh, as i said during the first part of the talk uh, the classical theories don't help anymore we uh, have uh, different uh, surprising behavior, which are strange uh, things that classical theories don't explain. And then we need to develop new theories for doing this. And uh, it's very different from a very traditional theoretical field, which has been established because uh, now what happens in deep learning theory is that you observe something empirically, then you need to do more amount of experiments and that is really done by computer vision people a lot. They do more amount of experiments to see that whether that kind of uh, surprising behavior do happen. And then the theoreticians like us, we jump in and try to develop theories that would explain or demonstrate these for even simpler models. We don't need a really complicated LSTM or uh, uh, something uh, with hundreds of layers and uh, dropout and everything. Uh, th those, uh, I mean, very complicated models are hard to analyze, but even if for simple machine learning neur neural network models, if we can explain why does some of these surprising things happen theoretically, it helps the practitioners to actually go back and modify their models to get desirable results or know that what should be done. And as I said, it's a very new field. So uh, the, the entire theory is sort of a work in progress. Uh, sorry, it's not working. It's work in progress. And uh, there is no well established theories. There are a couple of ideas that are popping up that are gaining some momentum. Um, but we do know that mostly generalization bounds don't work well. Uh, they are not very precise. Uh, they may help in some worse cases, but most of the times they don't even reflect reality. And uh, there are questions of how do we even get that. Uh, NTK is uh, turning out to be very promising, but uh, this gap between infinitely wide and finite with neural networks and what happens if we have a, um, a deep networks that uh, these become uh, 
these are important questions that are still unanswered. So there is a question, let me just take it. Uh, honestly, I don't know uh, an explanation why LSTMs manage to forget unnecessary tokens. I have never worked with LSTMs and uh, as I said, I'm, I try to explain or uh, there are uh, intuitions that are there, there. I don't know of them personally for LSTMs, but uh, uh, theoretically, it's very hard to say I'm at this stage. But you could try to look at whether there is a, I mean, there are NTKs for LSTMs, I think. Yeah. So you could try to look whether that explains some of the things. There's also something uh, very interesting that happens. I showed this a bias, uh, traditional curve, long time ago. Yeah, this curve that as we use more uh, over parameterized models, as we do overfitting, then they shouldn't generalize well. This is something that uh, happens in uh, uh, but this is something that people use in practice a lot for neural networks. They there would be neural networks with billions of parameters, and they seem to work perfectly well on uh, new data as well. And uh, this is uh, also something that um, is being studied nowadays. Uh, uh, so there is a particular phenomena called the double decent phenomena. So this. Uh, there's this U-shape, but then again, at some point, the uh, test error starts decreasing. And there is some literature uh, coming up on uh, when and why does overparameterize and doing overfitting uh, help. But uh, as I said, it's not a full-fledged theory. There are still gaps in the theory and uh, I mean, a purpose of my talk is to make everyone aware that, uh, well, deep learning is uh, not an area just for uh, doing fancy thing. It's a very, uh, it's an area for doing fundamental research as well. For instance, um, in uh, US uh, in 2020, um, a couple of universities got a huge amount of uh, funding uh, on uh, understanding the mathematics of machine learning and deep learning. And even in Germany, we recently have a, a, a special priority program of research on uh, the theory of deep learning. So there is interest coming up and, uh, and there is some promising, but there is quite a long way to go for the theory literature. And the best we can have is have new um, students to work on these things and uh, work on these kind of exciting topics because this is particularly a topic that uh, it's a theoretical topic, but it has a lot of practical implications at, in this current stage. Okay, that's um, all I wanted to say. Any questions? Yeah, hi Devaki. So, Aritam, I have one question. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, so basically, like uh, all your results are with uh, just one uh, uh, hidden layer, right? What it takes to like, do you have any insights on, say, suppose you have two hidden layers, uh, like how things are going to change? Like, what are the uh, challenges that you face? Like, just yeah. by looking at the expressions. Uh, actually, uh, this particular kernel is for uh, any depth, so p hidden layers. Um, and even the uh, uh, Radamaka bounds that I showed, they, uh, I just wanted, didn't want this complicated expression to pop up because it's very difficult to make sense of it. So, uh, but it can be done for uh, multiple hidden layers as well. So, most many of these results uh, can be uh, uh, also can be. Uh, derived from multiple hidden layers. Uh, the only problem that does come up is that, uh, and this is something that we don't really know. This, uh, if we derive this NTK matrix uh, for P hidden layers or very deep layers, it suddenly starts to become a bit different from 
what we observe in practice or even these radamaka bounds it doesn't really explain uh, what we observe uh, in uh, practical situations so the theory in at this current stage is not developed enough to explain uh, deep neural networks so it's it's sort of getting better but uh, <laughs> there's still a long way to go so uh, my but, particular yeah yeah go ahead sorry sorry Uh, but uh, everything can be derived for uh, uh, deeper networks as well. But but your bounds are valid for the even the deep deeper neural networks. Yeah yeah yeah. I mean the paper had uh, these uh, paper considers a uh, uh, L layer uh, network and then derives the Radomacher bounds. And even this one is for arbitrary layers. Okay. So next question is that very general, very general. So is a neural tangent kernels is the one way of analyzing uh, these deep neural networks, right? Like some getting some insights. And sometime back, uh, I think almost three or four years ago, I have seen people started analyzing these uh, restricted Boltzmann machines, etc. Right? Mm -hmm. But are there any different approaches, like apart from these neural tangent kernels? Do we want us to look at somewhere some new techniques or anything that is uh, from the literature? Do we have any of them? Okay. Um, new, the reason neural tangent kernels uh, became uh, more popular is because they are easier to understand for people. <laughs> But uh, more generally, uh, looking at this gradient flow, I mean, the neural tangent kernel comes from the gradient flow. It's only yes. when we uh, take it to very deep uh, or very wide scen scenarios it becomes simple so there uh, there are works francis buck works a lot on uh, looking at the gradient flow and then trying to give uh, understandings i mean we both of us were in this workshop where uh, we had a couple of people from uh, leipzig who were uh, looking at uh, the stochastic system or the stochastic dynamical system that comes out of uh, the of stochastic gradient descent so that's something another uh, easier uh, i mean more relatively easier to understand uh, aspect is don't even consider non linearities look, look at linear networks and then try to understand the dynamics there and uh, there is a belief uh, i mean sanjeev varra says a lot about uh, this kind of belief that it's a uh, i mean he started it but it's it's now popular among others as well so it uh, it's i mean the model is not that much important anymore because uh, what is equally important what is the optimization that we are using whether you, we are using gradient descent whether we are using some other kind of uh, optimization tool that impacts what we are learning and uh, this is something even in the overparameterized case uh, people are looking at the implicit bias of gradient descent okay so okay. that's another area okay just yeah. thanks any other questions okay there there is another question in the chat can you please talk about generative models or energy based models how would they help okay i really don't uh, know the Uh, I mean, okay. The theory for generative models is uh, is very uh, limited. So there is a, a recent paper on generative adversarial networks and consistency of uh, of that. Uh, but uh, again, it's it's not even at a stage where I could uh, simply say what it implies in practice. <laughs> but there there is one paper that you can look at at uh, of on consistent it's called consistency of a generative adversarial networks or consistency of gans it's an annals of statistics paper i think and energy based models i'm not so sure whether there is uh, anything i i don't know <laughs>